Hello everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the best platform around for distance learning in business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters and YouTube members for making this video possible, and we'd also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well, so please check the link in the description or click the join button below for more details. My name is Saba, and today we're investigating a very unique and uh, not so well known theory in portfolio optimization that is mean Gini optimization, developed by Charlotte and Yitzhaki in their 1984 Journal of Finance paper. This approach disregards the standard deviation as the measure of risk and suggests an arguably more appropriate measure for portfolio risk, that is, the Gini coefficient of the empirical return distributions. You might have heard of the Gini coefficient as the measure of inequality most commonly applied to income distributions or wealth distributions in economics. However, in one of the previous videos, I also showed an application of the Gini coefficient to portfolio weights as a concentration measure. Charlotte and Gizaki in 1984 showed that the Gini coefficient can be generalized and treated as a measure of risk for a particular distribution, and they apply it to a portfolio return distribution, and use it just as we use variance or standard deviation in conventional portfolio theory. And they even develop a asset pricing model and a portfolio frontier based on the mean Gini framework. However, here we will just uh, calculate the Gini coefficient for a portfolio and run some optimization techniques to make sense of which weights, which positions would this approach recommend. And as usual, we are dealing with six US stocks plus the market index, and we have 10 years worth of data for all of them. So first of all, let's calculate daily returns, dividing the price or total return index today by that of yesterday and subtracting one, dragging it across all time series and uh, enforcing it throughout the sample. Then let's calculate historical returns. And here let's do optimization based on historical returns for simplicity, just calculating uh, holding period returns for uh, annualized frequency, just dividing the last observation for a price or a total return index by the very first, raising it to the power of 1 over 10, as we have got 10 years in our sample and subtracting 1, and dragging it across for all of our 6 stocks. We are not really interested in the benchmark here. Now, we start with some uh, initial allocation, and uh, most commonly we just start with an equally weighted portfolio. Again, it doesn't matter if your optimization um, framework is smooth, then it would obviously converge to an optimal solution regardless, but to ease the uh, computational power and time for your Excel, start with something reasonable, like an equally weighted portfolio. And then we always need to check that the sum of weights is equal to 1, as we don't want money to appear from nowhere, and we don't want to leave our assets in cash for this particular application. You can obviously generalize and say that sum of weights is less than or equal to 1, and then the remaining uh, exposure would be a risk-free asset, in that instance, cash, with zero return and zero risk. And then we can simulate portfolio returns by applying the sum product function, calculating the weighted average of stock returns and the respective weights, with weights locked row-wise and enforced throughout. And finally, to calculate the Gini coefficient of the portfolio, the measure of risk in the mean Gini framework of Sheldon Yitzhaki, we need to calculate the covariance of the returns and their uh, ranks, meaning that we have to sort our portfolio returns from smallest to largest, from the very extreme negatives to the very extreme positives. And that would allow us to use the generalized Gini coefficient formula for an empirical distribution and figure out the risk of our portfolio and optimize it. So here we'd have our ranks starting with one, two, and then bottom right clicking it all the way down, figuring out that we've got 2,516 returns in total. That is consistent with 10 years of roughly 252 trading days in one. And for the sorted portfolio, we can apply the sort function. 
or we could have applied the small function, for example, saying that we apply the small function on the array of returns, and then referring to the first smallest element, second smallest, third smallest, and so on and so forth, to the largest, which is 2516th smallest, weirdly enough. However, to make it uh, more efficient computationally, as this particular approach would slow down our optimization time, we can simply apply the sort function and sort our portfolio returns, sort this array by the first index. Well, we haven't got much choice, isn't it? We want it sorted in ascending order, so one instead of negative one, and we want it sorted by rows instead of by columns, so we input false. That's the conventional parameterization of the sort function in Excel. And this function needs to be enforced using shift Control enter and that provides us with exactly the same output as the small function. However, it does it in one go, so it's more efficient for the purposes of our numerical optimization. Now we can calculate the covariance of returns with their ranks. So here are the ranks, here are the returns, and we can simply calculate the population covariance. Sheldon Yitzaki note that there is a sample adjustment, however, for simplicity and given the fact that we've got larger samples, generally, here we have got a quite large sample, you can use population functions for your covariance and for everything else. So population covariance between the ranks and the returns. And that gives us a covariance of 6.42. Now we can adjust it multiplying it by 2, dividing it by average historical return daily times the uh, number of observations n. So here we need to figure out the count. How many observations have we got? Well, 2,516. That is something we have already known. Just double checking. And the historical average, well, just simple average of portfolio returns over here. And now we can figure out the expected return, which is the sum product between our weights and our annualized holding period returns. And our Gini index would be 2 times the covariance we have just calculated, divided by the historical average times the count. And we have got a Gini index of 7.23. It might seem a little puzzling, because generally we assumed that in economics, for example, Gini coefficient is between 0 and 1. However, in economics, all entries to the distribution we're investigating, namely the distribution of income and wealth, are non-negative. For returns, uh, some returns, and to be fair, approximately half of returns, is indeed negative. So it means that the Gini coefficient can be uh, actually greater than 1. This is a surprise that you might encounter when first applying the Gini coefficient to a portfolio optimization, but that's not a mistake. That is there by design. It's not a bug, it's a feature. And now we can actually already run an optimization. The equivalent of the minimum variance portfolio would be a minimum Gini portfolio, where we optimize the Gini index to be the lowest possible, as it's, again, interpretable as a measure of risk. And Shalton Yitzaki actually proved that the Gini index does uh, preserve many properties that you wish a risk measure to have. It shares many properties with standard deviation, for example. So our minimum variance portfolio is now a minimum Gini portfolio. So we can click solve and minimize our portfolio's Gini coefficient by changing the weights while keeping the sum of weights to be equal to 1. Again, if you wish to hold some of your portfolio value as cash, this can be relaxed to be less than or equal to 1, however it would uh, slow down optimization time, and we're happy with uh, making unconstrained variables, namely our weights non-negative, as we are not necessarily inclined to short sell. If you wish to short sell, just untick that. And we are happy with sticking uh, to gradient descent, GRG non-linear, so we can click solve and wait until the algorithm converges. And we see that our minimum uh, Gini portfolio actually is quite heavily exposed to Microsoft. 51%, uh, more than 50% exposure to a quite risky stock. This is simply because 
standard deviation or uh, volatility is different to the uh, Gini coefficient in terms of its treatment of risk. As we're not necessarily uh, interested in minimizing the variability, but we are also interested in uh, uh, arguably minimizing the downside as we are uh, penalizing our portfolio, the Gini index is increasing, the more and uh, more severe you are in the negatives. The negative returns are the whole reason why Gini index for portfolios can be greater than one in the first place. So even the minimum risk portfolio, the equivalent of a minimum variance portfolio, is already quite strange, and we haven't even taken into account that Microsoft is the highest return stock. So what happens if we decide to, for example, calculate the portfolio with a um, lowest Gini index for a particular return target? Here we see that our minimum Gini portfolio has an expected return of 23.9% per annum. So having a target less than that is meaningless or not an effective constraint, as it would just return a minimum Gini portfolio, isn't it? So let's say um, that we want a portfolio with a 25% per year target. To specify that, let's say that we want to minimize our uh, Gini index, our portfolio Gini coefficient, subject to the following constraints. We want to add an extra constraint that our expected return should be greater than or equal to 0.25 or 25%. And let's see how the algorithm would adjust. Here we see that the Gini index has increased quite a bit with even greater exposure to Microsoft and no exposure to Coca-Cola or Caterpillar at all. Another way of parameterizing this problem would be to maximize returns subject to a Gini constraint. For example, let's say that we want to maximize our return over here subject to not the return constraints that can be deleted, but rather to a Gini constraint. What would be the best return possible if our Gini constraint is less than or equal to, well, let's say 6.2. If we want the best returning portfolio with this restriction on our risk measure, our Gini coefficient for the portfolio empirical return distribution. And now we can click solve and see the result it returns. We see that this result is even um, more concentrated with 68% of your portfolio being in Microsoft. And that provides uh, us with uh, some insight into uh, the perils of this approach and into the properties and peculiarities of this approach. As our risk measure is quite downside focused and it's focused on the empirical return distribution, that would be quite favoring stocks that historically had low negative return observations and that have performed uh, well historically on average, even if you are plugging in not historical returns, but for example, CAPM returns into your expected return calculations, as historical returns are implicitly being accounted for in your risk measure, as it has to do with the historical simulated portfolio return distribution. And that's all there is for the application of Min Gini uh, portfolio optimization as developed by Charlotte and Yitzake in Excel, as well as some of its applicability and limitations. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I'm eager to see any further suggestions for videos in business, finance, or economics you would like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you very much, and stay tuned.